Good morning. Well, there's a story that's told of a, of a man who was destitute, he was homeless, he had not a penny to his name, and so he asked God to bless him, and God gave him ten apples. He gave him three to trade for clothing, three to trade for shelter, and three, of course, for food. The last one was the biggest one, and God expected him to return that one to him as a thankful offering for all that God had blessed him with. But the man thought about it, and the more he thought about it, the more he came to the conclusion in his own mind that God had access to all the apples of the world. He wouldn't need this one, and so he decided to keep it for himself and ate it and gave God the core. And I think that story represents so often what happens in our culture. We take the blessings from God, and what we give him as a thankful offering is the crumbs or the leftovers. In the book of Genesis chapter 4, beginning in verse 3, we read these words. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel on his part also brought of the firstlings of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering he had no regard. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Another verse I want us to look at for just a few moments is found in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. We won't read it again. We'll put it on the screen. I thank Chad for reading it for us. The word better in the Greek language there is pleona, and it can mean greater or more important. Some have suggested that the implication of also brought, coupled with the plural firstlings in Genesis 4 and 4, suggests that Abel gave more abundantly than Cain did. It can literally mean that Abel gave more and greater quantity or value than Cain did. Abel acted in faith. And it seems that Cain acted more out of reason. Perhaps he thought to himself, if this is a, a good offering, then I can just give it and it's enough and God will be happy with getting what he gets from me. Nothing more, nothing less. And Cain's attitude is really timeless. There are many folks living in this day and age, many Christians, in fact, who have reasoned something similar in their minds, that God should be happy with whatever I give, no matter how minuscule my gift may be. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 6 through 13, we read of a woman named Mary who comes to Jesus and anoints him with a very costly perfume. We learn that it's pure nard, and nard was a rose-red ointment imported from India. Mark also tells us that she broke the alabaster jar containing this very expensive perfume. Now, this perfume could have been sold for more than 300 denarii at the time, which would have been about a year's worth of wages for the common laborer. In our culture, it would be worth thousands of dollars, and yet this woman poured it all out, anointing Jesus. And not only did she anoint him with the perfume, she then broke the very expensive alabaster jar or vial. This flask or this vial would have been very expensive at this time as well. And so therefore, she poured out all she had and then broke the jar. Now, what's significant about breaking the alabaster jar is that when a person would anoint uh, someone who was deceased, they would go ahead and break the jar and place the pieces at the burial spot as well to show that no expense had been spared in order to honor the dead. Now, whether she knew that at the time is anybody's guess, but nevertheless, her offering shows that she gave everything she had. Now, the response of the disciples is interesting because Mark records them as saying, why this waste? For this perfume might have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. John states that Judas Iscariot was the one indignant about wasting this perfume. And knowing his greedy nature, I doubt he was indignant about giving it to the poor. 
But we see that the disciples respond in much the same way that many people in this day and age would probably respond. Why are you wasting that very expensive perfume? And why are you breaking that very expensive jar? I mean, couldn't a little bit have served the same purpose? Why not take the stop route and just dab a couple of drops on Jesus to anoint him? Why do you have to go to the expense of breaking the jar as well? Why not use some knockoff perfume like you can get at Walmart, right? Why not, why not use that instead of the, the real expensive stuff? That tends to be how we think sometimes. We tend to hold back rather than to give all. We tend to give what is left over rather than to give out of abundance. Why do we feel so strongly that something is better than nothing? Well, because in our world, the concept is true, isn't it? I mean, for most everything, something is better than nothing. Eddie, if you're dying of thirst, you're not going to turn down a very small cup of water because you're holding out for a thermos full. You're going to take what you can get. If you're very hungry, you're not going to turn down some scraps or some crumbs because you're waiting for somebody to take you to Red Lobster. If you're somebody who is poor and destitute, you're not going to turn down a $10 bill because you're waiting for $100. you are going to take what you can get. Something is better than nothing in our culture. So why doesn't that transfer over to our spirituality? Is something better than nothing when it comes to my worship, when it comes to my faith, when it comes to my spiritual walk? I mean, isn't coming to church better than nothing? Even if I don't do anything while I'm here, even if I sleep while I'm here, isn't it better that I'm here than not be here? I mean, I come on Christmas and Easter. That's more than a lot of people do. Isn't that enough? Isn't it enough that I read my Bible and that I study daily? I mean, certainly that is something, right? Certainly God will be pleased with what I give him, even if it's a meager amount. He understands that I'm busy. Like Jack said, he understands that I have so many things going on in my life. Certainly he'll be pleased with whatever I can give him in the midst of all this chaos that I'm dealing with daily. Understand that Cain brought an offering. It's not like he didn't bring anything. He did bring something, right? I mean, shouldn't God be pleased that he brought something? A lot of people didn't bring anything. Cain brought something, but it wasn't good enough. My friends, we can't fool God. He knows our frame. He knows what we're capable of. He knows our heart and where our loyalties lie. And so what message are we sending God when we give him our leftovers? Are we not telling him that we place other things as more important in our lives than him? Are we not t uh, telling him that our hearts are full of other things and we are just giving him whatever we have left? You want to know why I'm against a food pantry at the church? Sounds like a random thought, doesn't it? No, at, at other churches I've been, we try to, we've tried a closed pantry. We tried a food pantry. I never liked the closed pantry idea. You know why? Because people who donate their clothes almost always donate their junk. We'd have a clothes pantry, and people would bring their sweaters that had holes in them, their jackets that had lost buttons or the zipper doesn't work anymore. They'd bring their junk, and they'd pawn it off on the church to give to someone else. And whenever you would approach the subject with someone, they'd say, hey, they need to be happy with what they can get. Beggars can't be choosers, right? Is that really the attitude that we want to convey? But that's the attitude that we give off so many times to God. That's the mentality that we approach God with. That God should be happy with anything. I mean, after all, beggars can't be choosers. At least I'm giving something. It may be leftovers. It may be meager. It may be minuscule. But at least he should be happy with something, right? It's this idea that we are doing something, and therefore that should be good enough, but not when it comes to our spiritual lives. In no way is that appropriate. All too often, our offering is something that we give to God because we really don't have it to give to anybody else. Nobody else needs it. We've covered all of our bases in our daily lives, and therefore, we've got this much left over, so this is what we're going to give God. It's something we can't use anyway. It's something that we don't want to give to anybody else because they have enough, and so we're going to give it to God. We give to our careers, our jobs, our school, our sports, whatever it is, and God gets the little bit that's left over. Turn with me in your Bibles to Malachi chapter 1. In Malachi chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, we read these words. 
A son honors his father, and a servant his master. Then if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my respect, says the Lord of hosts to you? O priests who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? You are presenting defiled food upon my altar. But you say, how have we defiled you? And that you say, the table of the Lord is to be despised. But when you present the blind for sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you present the lame and sick, is that not evil? Why not offer it to your governor? Would he be pleased with you? Or would, you re- or would he receive you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? But now will you not entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us? With such an offering on your part, will he receive any of you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among any of you, or one that, oh, if there were among you one who would shut the gates, that you might not uselessly kindle fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from you. For from the rising of the sun, even to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense is going to be offered to my name and a grain offering that is pure. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts but you are profaning it in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled and as for its fruit, its food is to be despised. You also say, my, how tiresome it is. And you disdainfully sniff at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring what was taken by robbery and what is lame or sick, so you bring the offering. Should I receive that from your hand, says the Lord? But cursed be the swindler who has a male in his flock and vows it but sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is feared among the nations. Now, the Jews had just returned from being in exile. The temple had been rebuilt. Greatness was restored, at least in part. But on the outside, while everything seemed to look great and grand, on the inside, things were crumbling because the people were, dis- were suffering from a terrible disease, the disease of complacency. Complacency had set in, and the people were wavering in their commitment. They weren't as dedicated as they should have been. Their hearts were not full of faith and dedication. Now, if you've ever read the book of Malachi, you know that it it starts out with the love of God and ends with a promise. Uh, The beginning and the ending are like two bookends. It's a great book. I encourage you to read it if you haven't in a while. And everything in the middle is about God getting the people from point A to point B. Remember, he starts with love and he ends with a promise. And in between is some pretty harsh rebuke and some discipline because God has got to get them to understand that they are suffering from complacency and they need to wake up. They're in a spiritual slumber and it's time to snap out of it. In verse 2, chapter 1, it reads, I have loved you, says the Lord. In verse 2 of chapter 4, it reads, But for you who fear my name, the Son of of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. So there's this love and there's this promise. But in between, we read what we just read a moment ago, among other things. And I want you to notice the primary focus of Malachi as he speaks to God. It's about honoring God, right? As he speaks for God, I should say. It's about honoring God. It's about doing what God would have them to do. It's about honoring him by giving their best. They had not been doing that. I don't know about you, but I find many similarities here in reading this with Malachi's audience and our audience today. Many of God's children today are no different in that they're going through the motions. They are settling for less. They have become complacent. And you note the charges made by the Lord. The priests were presenting defiled food on the altar. Do we do the same when we bring an offering that is less than what it should be? What are we presenting on the altar of God every Sunday? What are we presenting on that altar before Him? Well, it should be our lives, right? That is our sacrifice today. What kind of sacrifice are we placing on the altar? Are we giving all of ourselves or just a part? Are our minds wandering and thinking about all the different things we have to do today or during the week? Are we focused on things that are anything but spiritual when we should be offering to God our entire being? Are we presenting something that is defiled or are we presenting something that is subpar? 
The priests in Malachi's time were presenting the blind and the lame for sacrifice. Like I talked about a while ago, they were presenting the things that they couldn't use anyway, the things that no longer had any, any uh, a merit to them or, or could not serve them in any way. That's what they were presenting to God. That's how they were honoring him. They were totally ungrateful by giving him what they didn't want to begin with. They also say, my, how tiresome it is. In other words, how boring it is, how boring worship is, how tiresome this is. My friends, worship is not boring. It's not tiresome when you understand what it is. When you understand your relationship with God and what he did for you, you will worship automatically. That will be something that you do and something that you give your all to because you understand the relationship that you now have with God because of Jesus Christ. You understand what it means to give your all because he gave his all for you in sacrifice. When you understand that, you will worship and you won't ask questions like, you know, how did this suit me? But rather you'll ask, was I pleasing to God in my worship today? You won't make statements like, well, I didn't get anything out of that. Instead, you'll ask yourself, did I give everything to God in my worship? Did I put something into it? It's unfortunate how many times we bring an offering that is not acceptable and we're fooled into believing it is. When the priest first heard the words of the Lord through Malachi, they must have been thinking to themselves, that's right, you tell them, God, let them have it. But then notice that he turns the tables. He says, where is my honor? If I'm a master, where is my respect, says the Lord of hosts to you. But Malachi continues by calling the priest to the carpet and saying that you are offering defiled food. You're offering the lame and the sick and these kind of things. And the, and the priest asks, how have we defiled your name? And he tells them, you've done this. You've offered defiled food. You've, you, you've presented the lame and the sick. And they ask, but how have we defiled you? They just didn't get it, did they? He told them, and, and they still didn't see it. What's worse than the sin of complacency is to not be able to even see that you are complacent, to be blinded by your own staleness, that you can't even see that you are stuck in a spiritual rut. It's unfortunate that so many times we find ourselves in a spiritual slumber. We can't even see it, and this breeds frustration, even anger at times. That was Cain's response, wasn't it? His countenance had fallen. Abel offered a better sacrifice, although Cain knew what he should have done. He knew the guidelines for bringing the offering. God told him, you shouldn't be upset with anybody but yourself. He couldn't see for himself that this was an eye problem that he had to fix. He blamed Abel, he blamed God, and acted out in riotous wrath. Spiritual apathy is an I problem. Complacency is a me problem. We've got to figure out that we are the ones who are responsible, and we've got to do something about it. There is no excuse for asking God to bless a mediocre offering. No excuse. We must be bringing our very best when the Bible tells us that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, that is everything. That is all we have. That is our entire being. Anything less than that is not good enough. Something is not better than nothing when it comes to our offering before God. A woman's husband had been slipping out of, in and out of a coma for several months. Finally, he woke up. And he turned to his wife who was sitting beside him. She had never left his side. She had been by his bedside the whole time he was suffering. And he looked at her and he said, you know, honey, you have been with me through thick and thin. You were there with me when I lost my job. You were there with me when we lost the house due to a fire. You were there with me when I was shot. You've been there with me when I've suffered through this illness. You've been right there with me the whole time. He said, you know what I think, honey? And she said, what's that? And he said, I think you're bad luck. <laughs> Obviously, this man's perception of faithfulness was a bit skewed. And I think our definition or perception of faithfulness is a bit skewed at times as well. How do we often define faithfulness? In a spiritual sense, what do we always say? Well, so-and-so's here every time the doors are open. Is that really how we should define faithfulness? We define faithfulness as somebody who's at every service, 
or somebody who reads their Bible regularly, or somebody who uh, prays regularly, or somebody who does some good deeds. Now, all those things contribute to faithfulness, but you can do all of those things without truly being faithful, can't you? You can come to church and occupy a pew and never worship. You can forsake the assembly by being here. Do you realize that? You can study your Bible and never apply it to your life. You can pray, but only pray selfishly. It's kind of like the guy who told me, I know I told you this before, the guy who told me, I've been faithful to my wife for 25 years. I've never cheated on her. Is that the only way that we're faithful is by not cheating on our spouse in a marriage? Certainly there are other ways that we can be unfaithful. Just because we are here every time the doors are open doesn't mean that we are faithful Christians. That's how we describe a faithful Christian, but there are certainly other things that go in to faithfulness. We have a pretty low estimation of what faithfulness is, mainly because it's such a rare commodity in our culture today. We tend to to expect faithfulness in so many other areas of our lives. And yet when it comes to spiritual concerns, we have a really low standard for faithfulness. We get very upset when the AT&T guy or the Dish Network guy doesn't show up on time. We get rather upset when we go to the doctor and he doesn't get us in right when we get there. We expect faithfulness in so many other areas. We would be very unhappy if our boss came in and said, hey, I'm not going to be able to pay you this week. We expect him to pay us for for a job well done, right? We expect the post office to deliver our mail. We expect faithfulness in so many other areas of our lives, but when it comes to spirituality, we have a rather low standard of faithfulness. It's like we've said all along, as long as I give something, then that's got to be better than nothing, right? I read through the pages of Scripture, and I just don't find the concept that something is better than nothing. You can do it as well, and you can, you can tell me if you find it, but I just don't. In my study of Scripture, I don't find anywhere where something is better than nothing. In fact, what I find is quite the opposite. When I read through the pages of Scripture, I read about people like Paul who gave everything. I read about people like Stephen who were stoned to death because of their conviction and their boldness. People like Peter who were flogged for preaching the gospel. I see people who were sawn in two, who were burned at the stake, people who were living destitute in caves, wearing goatskin, sheepskin, running about because they were afflicted for, for preaching the gospel. They were persecuted for spreading the message. These people were willing to give their all for the sake of spreading the message. I don't find anywhere in Scripture where it was acceptable for someone to just give a little bit or to give their leftovers to God. Faithfulness, as defined in the pages of Scripture, is not about giving God some. It's about giving Him my all. Matthew 16, 24 and 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Philippians 3, 10 and 11. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Galatians 2 and 20. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Mark 12, 29 through 31. Jesus answered, the foremost is here, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. There is a standard that we should be striving to reach, a standard which has been set, and that standard or that goal is to deny ourselves, to take up a cross daily, and to follow after him, to be conformed to the death of Christ, to be crucified with him, to share in the fellowship of his sufferings, to give our entire being in devotion to him and to others. That's the standard. Simply put, it's to be like Christ. And to be like Christ will demand your all. There is no partial allegiance. There is no semi-devotion. It's an all-or-nothing proposition. It takes everything you've got 
but it's worth everything you've got. And my friends, it is an insult to aim too low. It is, it is a disgrace to lower the standard. It is absolutely unscriptural to suggest that I can give some, and that is enough. I want to leave you with a, with a quote from legendary Green Bay Packers coach Vince Lombardi. Not a theologian by any means, but this is pretty good. Here's what he says. The quality of a man's life is in direct proportion to his commitment to excellence, regardless of his chosen field or endeavor. He goes on to say, I firmly believe that any man's finest hour, his greatest fulfillment to all he holds dear, is that moment when he has worked his heart out in a good cause and lies exhausted on the field of battle, victorious. Does that describe you as a follower? Are there days that you get home and you're just exhausted from being a follower? Not exhausted from your job. Not exhausted from running around from one activity to another. I know we can all make that claim. But in your daily efforts, in striving to be more Christ-like, do you ever come home and you just lay down to put a close to the end of the day and you say, wow, I am exalted. It's hard work. It's a difficult task being a Christian. How many of us leave worship a better person? How many of us go throughout the week allowing God's word to change us, to alter our behavior, to, to remind us, to focus us on what it means to be a child of God? And how many of us, if our lives were to end today, would we be able to say, well, I'm exhausted? I have spent so much time in the field of battle serving God. I am worn out. What are we striving for? What are we offering? What is it that we are seeking in this relationship? God gave us everything he had. He held nothing back in offering his son. What are we giving to him? Maybe you have a need this morning. Maybe you're a child of God and you haven't been following. Maybe you have been unfaithful and you need to return and be restored. Let us help you with that. Or maybe, just maybe you're not a child of God and you've been contemplating that decision and you know what it takes to be a true follower and you want to be immersed in the waters of baptism for the remission of your sins this morning. Life is too short to settle for less. Come now as we stand and as we sing.